a lot of participants here from all around the world. Thank you all for joining us today for a special Center for Jewish Impact event with our friends at Anoli to discuss Israel's upcoming elections. This event is part of the CGI ongoing diplomatic saloon meetings. The Center for Jewish Impact is a Tel Aviv-based global Jewish relations group dedicated to fostering dialogue and partnerships between Israel's civil society and the Jewish and global diplomatic community. The upcoming elections mark a critical point for the State of Israel and its future as a Jewish and a democratic state. The results will have far-reaching implications for Israel's relations with international bodies, governments, and Jewish communities around the world. That is why we brought on our special guests, Yonit Levy and Jonathan Friedland, to help us to understand what exactly is expecting us weeks ahead. Yonit Levy is an Israeli journalist and the news anchor of Israel's most popular evening news program on Channel 12. Levy recently interviewed President Joe Biden along with many other world leaders. She joins us from Tel Aviv. Jonathan Friedland is an award-winning British journalist with Guardian and author. He joins us from London. Yonit and Jonathan, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us, as well as the thank to Channel 12 and Keshet team, and of course, all of you joining near and far. Now, on to the show. Yonit and Jonathan, please, the stage is yours. Hear me, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you very much, Robert. And thank you for everyone uh, tuning in and listening to us uh, and uh, joining us today. This is a very special edition of our Unholy podcast in front of a live audience. Everyone at their computer screens, but live audience uh, nonetheless. And of course, we want to thank our friends at the Center for Jewish Impact for inviting us to be part of this event. Um, together, we are going to take a very deep dive into Israeli elections 41 days in as we sit here on Wednesday and what they mean for Israel and for the world. And we're also going to be answering questions, but being the Jews that we are, we're going to be probably answering your questions with some more questions of our own. So Jonathan, do you want to get us uh, starting? I'm surprised we didn't go for two Jews, three questions. Um, <laughs> at least um, there's going to be a lot of, of questions. I mean, the first one is re really, I suppose that, you know, how on earth is Israel going into elections again? I mean, plenty of people will have thought, hang on a minute, we had one of these not that long ago, and one before that, and one before that. Um, most uh, democracies have an election cycle where there's an election every four years. In Britain, it's every five years. Israel seems to have made this an annual event. Uh, how come? How come we're back again with you um, getting the white suit that you wear on TV dry cleaned again. That's your election <laughs> night outfit. Regular viewers will know. How are we back? At, you know, how on earth are we back in this position again? Really? Yes. And how did I not organize my contract around these election night broadcasts? Because as you say, just to, to throw this statistic at you, right? I, at the end of this year, will have been anchoring the evening news for 20 years on Israeli television. This will be my 10th election night broadcast. So that is on average one every uh, two years. How did we get here is a very good question to start our conversation uh, with. Look, we are stuck for a reason, right? This isn't like a natural disaster that some countries have hurricanes and some countries have elections, right? There's a reason that we are stuck in this position since basically April 2019. Now, being Israelis, we're not going to agree on what the reason is because, and now we have to pause and say something that's probably the most important thing I'm going to say in this whole conversation, Jonathan, the old divisions of left and right and everything that everyone has always said about Israel, thought about Israel, that is gone out the window. There is one important division and it has been around for a few years now, and that is the division between the pro-Netanyahu bloc and the anti-Netanyahu bloc. Now, the reason we are stuck to be very, very brief on this is because there is a tie between those two blocks. The anti-BB bloc will say, listen, you need the, the man who is indicted in three different corruption cases, standing trial, refuses to leave the political system. And until he does, we will continue to be stuck. The BB camp is saying it's exactly the opposite because you are banning one important leader of the most uh, dominant party on the political map. That is the reason we are stuck. And if you just rescind your decision to ban him, we can form a government in five minutes. Those people also will also point out to the fact that the Supreme Court did not rule that Netanyahu cannot continue uh, to form a government. So that is why we are in this position and we'll continue this discussion, but we might be in that position for a while. 
It is a kind of um, Groundhog Day. Uh, this question of to you know to be be or not to be be is basically the question Israelis face. It seems each time each election cycle. You were mentioning that you've been anchoring the news for twenty years. I am um, have been a journalist even longer than that. But in my youth, as a cub reporter, really in Washington D.C. Back in the mid 1990s, guess who was prime minister of Israel then? <laughs> in 1996, elected um, one Bibi Netanyahu. He has been around so long, to the point where I have to say, for people outside the country, and whether they're journalists or diplomats, I think some of the diplomats uh, listening to our conversation may relate to this. The only question, whether it's our readers uh, or our um, viewers, or whether it is, you know, our diplomatic colleagues, the only question people really want to know is, is Bibi coming back or not? And I think there will be a lot of people who frankly won't really know who the names or know the names of the intervening leaders, currently Yair Lapid, previously Naftali Bennett, all they know is it wasn't Netanyahu. And then they sort of, you know, tell me when it is again, otherwise, um, you know, that the, the rest is sort of detail and commentary. I found it, it you know, really interesting, you, your question about him, or your point rather about him being in effect almost banned from, you know, the Prime Minister's office by these parties of the right uniting to thwart him and, and block his path to that seat that he has sat in longer than anyone else, including the first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. What what the question? I mean, as a first question, you know, I'm going to throw back to you: is does he still have that sort of radioactive toxicity on his own side, the nationalist right, that would prevent? We know Naftali Bennett is out of the picture now, but the likes of Gidon Saar and other figures of the Israeli right from sitting down with him again. We know that was a big deal last year, the year before, big enough to prevent there being the formation of a steady or stable government, certainly one with him in it. Is he still radio, is he still political kryptonite to those mm -hmm. former allies? Well, yes. I mean, first of all, you, you you completely focus on the interesting point, because the reason Netanyahu couldn't form a government, first election cycle, I'm taking you back to, it seems like ancient history now, April of 2019, we thought he has a sta had a stable government. The exit polls at 10 showed he had a 65-member coalition. Today, that would be anyone's dream, right? Um, and then Avigdor Lieberman, his former right-hand man, the man who was his chief of staff, the man who helped him, you know, uh, ascend to power, said, no, no, I'm not going to join Netanyahu. And after him followed suit, you know, Gidon Saar and, of course, Naftali Bennett, who crossed the road to become prime minister and thus extracting himself from the Netanyahu bloc. Yes, so that is the reason. Is he still toxic for these people? Right now, yes. Um, and of course, for Yair Lapid, and of course, for Benny Gantz, who, as you, I remind you, between elections three and four in May of 2020, actually decided to, yes, form a government with Netanyahu uh, under the promise that he will become prime minister in rotation after him. Netanyahu didn't keep that promise. That's how we arrived at election four. I'm sorry, I'm dropping a lot of information on everyone's head I'm just now. shocked, Yoni, <laughs> shocked that you told me a politician in Israel did not keep their promise. I'm, I, need to, I, I need to I need to head for rare. the fainting couch to cope. <laughs> it's very, very rare. Um, so, so for these people, he's still toxic. Yes. How long will that continue to be a th an issue if we might see ourselves after election five reaching election six is a question. And by the way, the question on the other side is how long will the Netanyahu bloc keep together? It has, by the way, quite remarkably, just think of the fact that the ultra orthodox would not leave his side for four election cycles, including now being thrown out of the government and in opposition, they would not leave the side. What will shift if Israel will not manage, if Netanyahu will not manage to form a government this time? By the way, still an option that he can reach that ma magic number 61. We're always talking about that because the Knesset has 120 seats and 61 is the majority you need. Still an option. You said something about his sheer longevity. I think we have to pause on that. We have been through four election cycles, a global pandemic, a flare up in Gaza, uh, and a tectonic historic government in Israel, and we're still sitting here and asking the same question we asked after elections won. Can Netanyahu form a government? Can he reach the magic number of 16? That is really the question. It is. I mean, the you, um, unholy listeners will know, were the person who predicted what at the time seemed a wild scenario, uh, which was that somebody who was barely on a whole lot of other people's radar, namely Naftali Bennett, could be 
the next prime minister. You said this. He um, thought I was oh, wacky. Uh, and, and you were right. I mean, he, you know, people didn't think, think see it was coming, but he, in that last cycle, you got that right. So what are the game out for us? The difference, in our, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of them. One is that Netanyahu gets clears the hurdle and becomes prime minister comfortably with the majority coalition over over 61 uh, seats. That's one very clear outcome. Another is that it is yet another deadlock. The That would then be, you know, the fifth election since 2019, I think, to end in a deadlock. And we'd have to have another round. So between those two polls, uh, you know, polls, P.O., uh, L.E.S., um, those ones what are the other scenarios that we should watch out for um and i suppose just to put this into the mix it's partly depends we were just talking just a second ago about the toxicity he retains among politicians whether former allies of his lieberman Saar, will sit down with him but the question i suppose is whether he still remains toxic enough among voters on the right that they will go for politicians who have distanced themselves from him so and you know i just throw that in there but you, you know you're so good at sort of modeling out the kind of different outcomes that can happen so what are some of them that we should be preparing for on election night and in the weeks that follow you want me to give you my crazy scenarios I'm yeah go just, crazy i'm not, go not crazy. just doling those out with no you know any more uh sort of convincing on your part no i'm kidding look um again if we need to give the percentage points, I would say that right now we're looking at two main options. One would be, as you say, Netanyahu with a, I wouldn't call it a comfortable majority. It's not going to be comfortable. Even if he gets the 61, he will have a coalition that is very unruly with uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir that we can uh, discuss a little bit, the far, far right of the Israeli map, and with the ultra-Orthodox. It's not going to be a picnic for him. He might try to pick off someone from the other side, the anti-BB block, right? Someone like Gantz, someone like Gidon Saar. What will be their incentive to do that? I'm not sure. Um, there is a, 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 two, There are obviously two other options. One is Benny Gantz becoming the prime minister. We talked about this a little bit on the podcast in recent episodes. If he manages to break away the ultra-Orthodox from Netanyahu's block and become prime minister, because he is the only player on the board who can basically play on both camps, that doesn't look likely, but Israeli politics has already proven to us that you know the unlikely can become the possible quite quickly. If I had told you two years ago, you know, not only Naftali Bennett will become prime minister, it sounded pretty wacky, but he will reside over a coalition with the with an Islamist Arab party and merits of the Israeli left, you would have said, you know, go see a doctor because you sound a little crazy. So that is an option of Benny Gantz, and of course, the option of somehow. Yair Lapid not only be staying as caretaker, ahead of a caretaker government because we're going to six elections, but actually becoming the, the prime minister proper, it's not in the numbers, but again, it could happen theoretically that this is, uh, that this is, in, is in play. I think we should take a question from one of the very <laughs> eminent diplomats who form our uh, live audience today. And in advance, some of our uh, very uh, eminent uh, representatives of foreign governments have sent in some questions and let's kick off with our first ambassador to pose a question uh, let's hear that one question number one hello i am bardil Tsanai, albanian ambassador in israel my question is how the panelists would describe the voting shift in the upcoming election in the view of new coalitions occurred between political parties. So this is right on the point you were making. Uh, Ambassador Sanai of Albania asks the question of, of, of a voting shift in the upcoming election that's partly in the light of the, that new coalition, so-called coalition of change, that very you know, interesting experiment. We had on our podcast Shimrit Meir, who was a really close advisor to um, Naftali uh, Bennett as Prime Minister, who I think described it, you'll tell me, was it a magnificent failure? or a, 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 I think magnificent failure was the phrase she used. Yeah, that's the frame. Or she said glorious failure. A glorious the, failure. The first experiment that failed, yeah. Yeah, I mean, an experiment that failed, it was how she, having, and she just quit the, the, you know, her post there just weeks before the coalition unraveled. But she described it, you described it just a moment ago, this sort of improbable collection of political parties ranging all the way from a former settlers leader, Naftali Bennett, leader of the settlers in the West Bank, all the way through to the you know, left party, the anti-occupation party of Meretz, 
uh, and in, in, including, as you said, the Islamist party, Ram, an amazing and sort of improbable motley crew of parties. Uh, I, you know, the ambassador asks from Albania a question that I have to say is on my mind a lot too, which is, is the premise of the election that Israel is going into now, that whether it was magnificent or not, that that effort was a failure, that actually it was not a success to have an Arab party in government, that it was not a success to have the left and parties of the traditional right working together? Or is there a constituency of Israeli voters who say, yeah, I really liked that. That was a different kind of politics from the Netanyahu brand of politics. I liked seeing Arabs around the table and leftists and rightists joining together. So I think, you know, often elections are a judgment on what's gone before, up or down, a referendum on whether it was a success or failure. So on that question, where, where are Israelis at on their judgment of the government that's just gone? Um, well, first of all, it doesn't have to be either or, I think. You can think it was a failure, which, I mean, it was because the government didn't survive. It lasted for a year and then it lost its majority in the Knesset and had to dissolve. So it was a failure. It's not only a PR story or a premise, it really was. And you can still say, but I like the fact that there was uh, cooperation between all sides of the political map, right? And, and when you hear what Yair Lapid is saying, he didn't give an interview to The Atlantic, he said, I am the answer, the centrist idea of putting all these people together is the answer, answer to populism, right? Had it worked, it could have maybe imported, Israel could have uh, um, exported this to under, other countries. So you can, you can think, I think there are Israelis who, who liked this government or in the center left of the, of the political uh, uh, map. Uh, but you're right about the fact that the way that is, this government is judged will have an effect. And I think the main question here, and this is, there are two things to watch in this, in this election, two things that will, the key decisions that will actually uh, play into what the results will be. One is the Arab vote. And to know what the Arabs are going to vote or what the voter turnout of the Israeli Arabs will be, you have to ask the question, this historic experiment with, for the first time, uh, um, uh, a party, an Islamist party, an Arab party inside the coalition, do we think it's a failure? Do the voters of Ram, the United Arab List, think it was a failure? And the general question is, uh, the general answer would be, it wasn't a great success. It wasn't a great success, I think, in their view for a few reasons. One, they didn't get enough of the budget they were promised, at least $30 billion. Uh, shekels, they got about four because of the time, right? It was a, a, a government that lasted for a year. The other answer is there was still a, a problem of violence, especially gang violence in the Arab community that hasn't been dealt with well enough because again, not enough time. And and third is the issue of, of the Palestinian issue. We still had flare-ups in Gaza. We, there was still an issue in, in the uh, Dome of the Rock. So I think that the Arab society in general, to the extent that I can say what they feel, is th they feel like they haven't, they didn't get a good enough deal I think that might affect the way they vote next time. And that will, of course, affect the results of, of the election. Yeah, and on, on, on that, I mean, the, the word is that the joint list, that coalition of the Arab parties that did not include Ram, the Islamist party, is not going to be cohered and a block on offer again for the next election. And the, uh, well, you tell me, but the, I think the expectation is that the overall Arab turnout will fall and therefore Arab representation in the next Knesset will potentially be lower than it yeah. was. And that suggests a verdict, which is troubling because the reason why Yair Lapid was right to say people around the world were looking to some extent, obviously, you know, you know, within parameters, but were interested in the fate of this coalition and his framing as a rebuttal, a rebuke to populism was partly, yes, people from across the divide working together. It seemed like an antidote to polarization, but there was a specific issue there of a minority, an ethnic minority in the country, national minority um, in the country, mm -hmm. um, that was, you know, more that was at stake here than just the fortunes of Mansour Abbas and, and the Ram party. It was about can, for the first time, an Arab political party uh, form part of the governance of a majority Jewish state. And so a big question was on the line there. And so I and others will be looking at these results to see what's the verdict? What do Arab Israelis say about that? And what do Jewish Israelis say? And it seems as if so far, they're not really giving it a thumbs up, that notion of participation in the democratic system. And it may be a step, back, a, a, a step backwards to the era when a lot of uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Arab Israelis, did not take part, sort of boycotted the democratic system.
Yes, but again, the joint, uh, as you see, right at, right at the buzzer, the joint list broke apart and it broke into, you have the United Arab list, the Islamists who have run apart, uh, 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 divided from them last election as well. And then you have running together the Hadash, which is the communist party in Tal. I'm trying to not go too granular on this, the more middle- Go granular. We like yeah. granular here. <laughs> so you have the, the Hadash Tal running together, which is the more sort of the communists running with the bourgeois, if you want, the communists running with the middle-class Arab society, Ayman Oda and Ahmed Tibi, and you have Balad, the nationalistic Palestinian-Israeli party. The minute they are detached from the Ayman Oda and Ahmed Tibi party, that may allow from, for Lapid to sit with them in a government or have some sort of coalition deal with them. They would not play that game if Balad, uh, the nationalist party, the Palestinian party would be with them. So that is a, a question of what... A, who will pass the threshold? That's a good question. Obviously, when you look at a, an exit polls on election night, if there are more than one or two Arab parties, it doesn't uh, cross the threshold. Netanyahu is the next prime minister of Israel. I mean, that would be an easy way of seeing what, what the results are. Yeah, I mean, that's why the, that was the founding logic of the joint list, to ensure that you didn't have votes that went to waste by falling below the threshold. A, a point, by the way, that applies to a whole lot of different sectors of Israeli side of the left, uh, you know, for example, with that, we talked about that on last week's episode of Unholy, the question of whether they would cohere into a block of merits and labor, uh, etc. Because the fear under Israel's system is that if you don't get enough votes to clear that bar, those votes can go to waste, which is why parties sort of club together and, which, and which cohere. Which is why was worried about uniting his block to, to not lose even one vote, whereas the other side is, you know, uh, how shall we say this, uh, a bit more, arrives a bit more messy to these elections. I, I'm, I'm echoing that line by Bill Clinton, where he said Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. So it's definitely to say that the right side of the political map, or I, I, I correct myself, the pro BB block of the political map is more organized and in line than the left part. Just think of how many people think in the uh, uh, anti bb block that they serve to be prime minister. Not Yair Lapid, right? Benny Gantz, Marav Michaeli, and others, Avigdor Lieberman, all think that they should be the prime minister uh, and not Yair Lapid. Well, we have another question. Why don't you go ahead and introduce our second question, Johnny? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, you know what? Let's just uh, hear it. It's question number two, and we'll talk about it. I am Fidel Reyes Lee. Guatemala Deputy President of the Parliamentary Friendship Group Guatemala and Israel. I want to ask about the next elections. Do you think that this time the elected Prime Minister will complete the constitutional period? So do we think that the Prime Minister this time will serve out the complete constitutional period, which would be four years? I mean, yeah, it would you know, be... It took me a minute to, to try and remember what the full period is. It took me, I was like, what's the full period? Is it four? Is it, it's four. It's four. Uh, because I, I don't, when, when did this last happen? Uh, 2009, I think, was the last time Netanyahu uh, became prime minister and then uh, stayed prime minister until, until 2013. Since then, there are only early elections called. That is amazing. And it was a novelty um, then, by the way. It, yes. it, it's not the norm. I mean, you know, like in American political rallies, the crowd are chanting four more years. In Israel, it's four more months because you just never know when they, when a government is going to fall. But go on. They, what do you think to um, Dr. <sighs> Reis Lee's question from Guatemala? His question uh, from the Guatemala-Israel uh, Parliamentary Friendship Group. Really interesting. Do you know what's in the what's on the card? You know, if I'm looking at my magic eight ball, first of all, let's let's have a government. Like let's form a government, which I can't even bet all the money in my pockets on that. I prefer to bet all the money in your pockets, to be honest, in mine. So I can't even bet that that um, will happen. It doesn't look like it, because again, the one thing that is ailing the political system in this country still exists, no matter what, which is that deadlock between, I'm sorry to sound like I'm repeating myself uh, uh, like a broken record here, but it's between the anti-BB camp and pro-BB camp. Until that is resolved, in one way or another, I don't see a full uh, a government holding on for four years, sadly, because I think Israel really needs stability. It has serious issues to deal with. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to say that I, I don't see that happen in the near future. No, I, I'm sort of with you. A reminder um, that you can, if you're listening to this live, uh, you can ask your questions in the chat or using the Q&A function. Uh, a few people 
have been doing that. And uh, it goes actually, well, why don't we go to our, uh, uh, well, we could ask our third question. No, I was just going to, um, on that, somebody, uh, Carrie Hart has offered a question during the conversation saying, why hasn't there been electoral reform up until now? And what will it take to see that in the future? I mean, this is the thing, isn't it, with these constant election cycles. And as you said, you just, it's a one-off that we have to go back more than a decade to remember a, a government serving out its full term. You know, again, people from afar look at this and think, well, the obvious answer is to change the electoral system, which builds in this kind of instability where there are so many little parties. I know the threshold has been increased in recent years to, you know, back in the day, it was when I first started following Israeli elections, 1% was enough to get you a seat in the Knesset. Uh, now it requires a bit more than that, but still in the single, lowish single figures. So, um, you know, is there anybody having that conversation? Or is there anyone, mm. you know, on the op-ed pages in the Knesset themselves saying, this is a crazy way to run a system and we should actually have some electoral reform? That was a question from Carrie Hart listening to us. Yeah, I'm going to uh, add to this a question, uh, by the way, it was just very similar from uh, Am Yisrael Chai in Atlanta. It's a question that we got as well. Do you think the electoral threshold should be lowered, they say? Ever since it was raised, we saw political uh, turmoil. Well, um, I think that the political turmoil is not only due to the electoral threshold that was raised indeed in 2015 to three and a quarter. That means you need four mandates to uh, uh, get into the Knesset and not one or two. It is a question, and to, to, to answer, I think, Jonathan, first of all, you can't change the rules of the game while you're still playing the game, right? And only, I think, when things actually settle down will we be able to discuss this at length and see what can be changed. I think the argument about the threshold is an argument that we should have. I'm not sure if the uh, answer is, by the way, to raise the threshold to the extent that only big parties can enter or lower it so much that you uh, have splinter parties and then it's going to be maybe easier to form a coalition, but it's not, I'm not sure it's going to be a stable one. I don't know what the answer is, but it's definite that you can't ask these questions while the whole thing is still, is still going on. Now I'm going to turn this on you for a minute, my friend, and ask you, because what concerns me as an Israeli is, is how this whole thing is being portrayed outside, because it does, first of all, it looks like we're you know, we're not doing anything but going to the polls. I mean, it's, I don't even know, when I hear these uh, international reports about Israel, like, are they making fun of us? Like, that is my my uh, thing. But also what, you know, obviously, Ben Gvir being a phenomenon, Itamar Ben Gvir of the far, far right, might in the polls get 10 or 12 seats. That's 10% of the Knesset. What does that mean if he wins? And if Netanyahu sets up a coalition that looks like that, what does that mean for the way Israel is portrayed outside of the borders of our country? Well, I think that the degree of interest in this uh, election uh, and Israeli elections has been a story of diminishing returns in a way. The fact they have become more frequent has coincided with and in part triggered a shrinking of the interest because it's becoming more routine. I mean, an Israeli election was once a bit of an event in you know foreign news terms and is less of one when there is one kind of every nine months or so you know it's like you missed the bus okay another one will be coming along shortly and so you know that 2009 election I remember the, you know being sent by my newspaper the Guardian to cover that that was a big deal now not so much because as I say there's another one in the next year so that's part of it I think the Netanyahu question is the only question that if again that foreign news organizations and perhaps again diplomats will really that's the top line as we say in, in our business, that's the sort of main thing. Um, that said, I notice, and I've been wondering about this a bit anyway, Israeli elections, it seems to me, always have sort of two stories that are yielded. One is the top line of who is going to be the new prime minister. But there's, all, there's very often a phenomenon, a party that sort of erupts and gathers attention. Remember, the Pensioners Party was the story of the thing. There was Yair Lapid himself. Do you remember what year that was? 2006 I'm just uh, yeah no this is we you're getting us onto our top trivia topics here I would have guessed 2005 but that would have been the wrong year so um the pensioners party was once um yeah Ilipid was once himself his father was once the big sensation the Shinui party 
you know, you go all the way back um, to, you know, the uh, uh, precursor of the Shinui party back in the 70s. There are these things that come and go usually. We've said before that Yair Lapid is a very notable exception to that rule because he has stayed the course over a decade in politics. I wonder if the second order story is, and maybe we should get on to them, of the next election is going to be Ben Gvir and the religious Zionism party. The idea, you know, it's easier for me to say this than you, but a party of the far right, of, of a racist and fascistic party is how certainly they will be described internationally. Um, not just breaking through so they're represented in the Knesset, but getting a dozen or more seats. That I'm, you know, I, I'm placing a sort of bleak bet with myself that that will be the story to come out of election night. Um, and so what about them? Are we, what, you know, what's going on on the right? Who, you know, what, what else, what's the pitch that is being made to them? What are the things their, you know, candidates are saying? I read and find it, you know, striking that the idea of young ultra-religious, uh, ultra-orthodox voters who used to just mm -hmm. fall in line and vote for their ultra-Orthodox parties are quite drawn to this man, Itamar ben Gvir, and his very populist, aggressive, ultra-nationalist, chauvinist, and, and racist message. But what, do, what can you tell us about what's happening on that part of the wild shores of the far right? Well, obviously, this will be a question, and a huge question, on election night. How many seats will this religious Zionist party uh, of Bezal Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gvir uh, uh, receive. I think a lot of people will look at, and, and, and we talked about Itamar Ben-Gvir in one of our previous episodes, and you said, you know, what happened to Israeli society? And I, I said, it's not only Israeli society. We need to see this and zoom out of this phenomenon and see that populism or extremism is an answer to very complicated problems is an issue the world over. And he's part of that phenomenon. Obviously, the Israeli public has moved to the right, to the extent that some of his ideas seem more palatable. And he himself has managed, is a very charismatic figure, has managed to gloss over a lot of his opinions so they become palatable to the Israeli uh, um, a constituency. I, I uh, think I told you the story of him, uh, of a kind of video that caught him explaining to his supporters, stop yelling death to all Arabs, yell death to all terrorists, because he understands that the way to re get into the Israeli mainstream is to sound less extreme. Um, and, and again, is the Israeli public since the year, since the second intifada that has gone through uh, an immense amount of terror attacks has changed, it has changed all of us. And I think that that explains a little bit about how the Israeli public moved to the right and explains some of the Itamar ben -Gvil phenomenon. Uh, and of course, this will be something to, to follow very closely uh, in, these, uh, in these elections. If he in any way becomes part of Netanyahu's coalition, um, that's not going to be an easy life for Netanyahu. Um, the, the, also, I think it will be some sort of a dilemma for Ben Gvir himself. Will he want to stay in sort of an opposition to this government? Will he want to enter into? Because the minute he does, he becomes part of the game, and then he's less attractive to the people who want the anti-establishment uh, hero, which some of them see him as that right now. I think um, relevant to this is the diaspora. Jews in the diaspora will have, their collective heart will sink at the thought of somebody like him i think you know there are obviously there will be diaspora supporters of ben gvir people in the uh, uh, jews around the world who are also of the right but largely those jews who you know feel an attachment to israel and an affinity with israel but often find themselves defending israel from critics will find that is a tall order those people by the way those sort of liberal diaspora jews really liked were very comfortable with the coalition of change the lapid bennett offer uh, the pluralism of it was appealing um, for them. I think this will be a really hard sell. If they have to, once again, be, explain to people that no, they don't necessarily agree with the Prime Minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu, and on top of that, there's some ultra-rightist with a long back, ca back catalogue of pretty hateful statements. That will be a huge strain for diaspora Jews, and I think it would be a strain for Israel's friends around the world. I mean, Joe Biden has, um, you know, found it more, um, con you know, um, uh, congenial to have in Israel a leader who is not uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. That's been easier for him, and it would be harder and harder still if it's Netanyahu, you know, propped up or kept in office 
by a party of the far right. Democrats, people on his own side, will look at that uh, catalogue of remarks by somebody and say, what is you know, our president doing shaking hands with a government that includes elements like this? So there's a world of pain awaiting Jews around the world, Israel's friends around the world, including governments, um, if that is the way it indeed goes, I would suggest. Yeah. Well, also, you, you think that that would bring out, that galvanizes both bases, right? I mean, if you say the name Itamar ben to the Israeli center left, that's going to get them out to the polls. If you say that name to the Israeli Arab population, that might get them into the polls to, to thwart Ben Gvir himself. So he plays in all kinds of directions. I really have a hard time saying uh, 30, 41 days in, what uh, left for the elections, what, what, this, what the, the outcome will be. But it's definitely a very big question. Well, since I've mentioned diaspora, why don't we hear a question on that theme? Um, it's question number four of those, it was the fourth of the ones sent in. Um, so if we're able to hear question four, why don't we do that? Hi, Yonit and Jonathan. This is Michael Weger from the Board of Deputies of British Jews. I'm wondering whether you think that this forthcoming election will produce an outcome of an Israeli Knesset that is more or less sympathetic to the interests and concerns of the Jewish diaspora. Thank you. I mean, great to hear from Michael Weger, a former Mensch of the Week on our uh, podcast, I think, um, and good that he asked us that question. I, I, as I said, I think, you know, there are those issues that formally go in the kind of diaspora portfolio, and they're often issues that touch on Jewish identity, you know, Israeli, uh, it's law on the law of return, who does it define as a Jew, does it accept conversions by you know religious conversions by reform rabbis or only religious conversions that have been performed by orthodox rabbis those are questions there are uh, jewish women in diaspora who would like to see movement on for example access and equality of religious access services at the western wall in jerusalem all of these sorts of issues that are traditionally part of that diaspora you know uh, portfolio that said, I do think that the main one um, is one that isn't ever formally you know, branded as a diaspora issue, but it is the sort of complexion and composition of an Israeli government. And I venture to say, I don't know whether Michael Weigel and other diaspora leaders would agree with me, but that uh, what is, you know, his word sympathetic to the interests and concerns of the Jewish diaspora, I think most Jews in the diaspora would prefer a government that isn't of such a hawkish or ultra nationalist stripe that it causes discomfort for them in their own communities and societies. Well, I mean, the important thing I think to, to note about this um, uh, outgoing government is that for the first time in a long time, we didn't have the ultra Orthodox parties inside the coalition. And that gave this government an option because remember, in, in all other issues, they had a veto, right? The left side and the right side had a veto. So you can move with the Palestinian track. You can annex, on the other hand, because each side had their own veto. You can move in certain areas. But in areas like the religion, the, the connection between religion and, and state, you could move. And they tried to do that, right? They tried to make differences that I think could have made a difference also to diaspora Jews in relation to the Kotel uh, compromise, in relation to, you mentioned this, conversion, what Matan Kahana, the... Uh, um, Minister of Religious Affairs tried to do at the time was to say um, the, the take the power from the chief rabbinate, right, and say that in different cities in Israel, the rabbis of the cities could make the could, could could be in charge of conversions. That would give them more power. That didn't pass because they had only a year. So essentially, not a lot of the status quo in these issues changed, even though they had the intention to change them. It really I, the, to answer specifically the question, I think it really. The question will be, will the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox be part of this next coalition? And then that would change in one way or the other, I think. Really glad you've got us into the question of the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox um, block. I mean, we had a question from Dan Green, CEO of World Ort, which uh, is headquartered here in London, saying, you know, we're investing in projects right across the educational spectrum from affiliation with Haredi schools, Jewish and Bedouin schools, and so on. How will a new coalition support or hinder this work? I mean, just on the Haredi thing, there, as you said earlier, there have until now 
really fallen behind Netanyahu, even at the point of being in opposition. And you and other commentators have wondered if how long that holds, how, how long will their patience run? Because they are in politics to be in government. They're not in politics to be, sit forever in opposition. They're there because they need to deliver to their constituents. So, I mean, is this, you know, the, the last chance for Netanyahu to hold them? Do they, if, they, if he can't do it, do they cross the floor and go with someone else, and you mentioned Benny Gantz before. But also within that is, a, is a, to me, a really, uh, I mean, I'm just interested in Haredi voters and where you think they're going. And the, this pressure, I mean, world, world ought would be part of it, but to make sure more Haredi Jews are in education, that they become economically active. Uh, you know, are, what, 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 uh, is that a discussion Haredi voters are actually themselves having of who, you know, who's best for our future? Or are there, are, are there other secular voters who are saying, look, what are we going to do about this group of people who at the moment are not economically contributing to the society through work and taxation and so on? How is that playing out, in other words, as an issue both for the voters themselves and for other people thinking about them? For, first of all, it's a huge issue, right? I mean, when you think of the fact that in eight years, 2030, the population of Israel will be 11 million and there will be 2 million ultra-Orthodox, the question of their education, we saw this discussion this week on the New York Times and in Israel, right? The core studies, do they study math? Do they study English or Hebrew? Um, do they study science? What do they study and will they be part of the workforce is a crucial question for Israeli society. So everyone is asking this question. And, and what you're saying is, first of all, I think the, the ultra-Orthodox are the only parties in Israel who actually have a constituency, right? They, they have a group, they vote as a group, they have a lot of power as a group. And will their patience run out if even now, Netanyahu, after the fifth elections, can't form a government, but they need budgets, they need to be part of the government. Will they uh, cross uh, the threshold, cross the road and, and join a coalition with Benny Gantz, which is someone who is palatable for them, by the way, Yair Lapid is much less. Um, it is a, is a key question. There were some insinuations made by United Torah Judaism, the Ashkenazi part of the ultra-Orthodox uh, political map, saying they might. Then they took it back because their voters didn't like it. Remember the United Torah Judaism, believe it or not, are losing a, some of their votes for the Itam al the religious Zionist party. So they took it back. I don't know what they'll do in reality. Uh, Shas, which is the other part of the ultra-Orthodox party, I don't see them leaving Netanyahu's side. Uh, in the near future. But you're, you're right about this being an urgent question, which is asked not only by the secular part of Israel, also inside the community itself. We have a lot of other questions, by the way. There's a question I'm itching to ask you, which we can go away from the, um, you know, the main sort of question about uh, Israeli uh, politics. But um, I'm not sure who it was who asked us uh, this question. Oh, I, I know. It's um, the Times of Israel. It's Raul uh, Woodward. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but he asked us um, what of the UK's political system should be adopted in Israel and what would be a disaster if it were. What of the British system should be adapted into, adopted into the Israeli system, Jonathan? Well, Israel clearly needs a queen, you need. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at a very strong candidate for that role. <laughs> Sheer longevity, you've done the 20 years. No one knows your views on any issues, just like um, the late Queen here. So I think um, I think Israel could do with a constitutional monarch. <laughs> I joke, of course. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the you know Israel is a parliamentary system, and is, so is this country. A dysfunctional but, parliamentary system. And, and what I, what I, what I was going to say was that you know the Britain has a first past the post system, and therefore it doesn't get into this thing of coalitions but Britain has itself not been a major advert for political stability you know a hung parliament in uh, 2017 where they, there was no clear verdict from the voters and then in um, 2020 uh, 2019 rather a new government with the new prime minister and yet Boris Johnson as you've seen did not last longer than three years so we're reaching almost Israeli levels of instability uh, here in the UK. So I'm not sure the British system is much of an advertisement either. Um, I, I wanted to just look at one of the questions that's come through while we've been talking. Um, and that is from uh, Joel Gutman, which, which election result gives the best chances of a peace process being revitalized? And a few others have asked um, questions in, in a similar vein about the you know foreign policy you may call it or you may call it the, its relationship with the Palestinian question 
We haven't talked much about the left parties who would be the ones traditionally interested in this. You know, 30 years ago, an Israeli election, 1992, Rabin versus Shamir, was entirely about this question that Joel Gutman asks. Am I right in thinking that it's just a non-issue now, that no one is talking about who's got a plan for the conflict with the Palestinians, for the, with the, you know, the occupation of the territories? I'm, I'm guessing this is not even really on the agenda. No, it is on the agenda. Uh, Benny Gantz gave an interview to the Otachonot, a very popular newspaper, just this uh, weekend. And, um, and he said his, the headline was, we need to reach out to the Palestinians and, uh, and, and, and you know, try and somehow achieve peace with them. It really is on the agenda. The problem is that the parties who want to follow through with this agenda are shrinking more and more uh, in Israeli society, the question why Israel has moved to the right, I talked about that a little, but um, there's less and less power here. Look, you talked about the 1992 Rabin Shamir uh, um, battle in which Rabin uh, obviously won. There were more than 40 seats for the labor and for the Likud. Today, labor has seven seats and there are some polls where it's really dangling on the electoral threshold. Obviously, the Israeli population moved to the right in many ways. It's really interesting, by the way, because in polls done by the Israeli uh, Democracy Institute, what you'll see is 15 or 14% of the Israeli public defining themselves as left. But when you ask them, would you want to go for a two-state solution? Would you want to go for a Palestinian plan, you know, peace plan or anything like that? You have like the 60 and 70% of Israelis saying yes. So it's a very interesting discrepancy there. Look, I don't think a lot of people are voting on that question. In that way, I agree that it's not really on the table, but this is one of the most, it's not the most urgent question in Israel. And the answer to, the simple answer to the question, what, what would be the, the result that will uh, bring forth a peace uh, process? I would say um, a result that is conclusive because at some point or another, whatever government sits in Israel will have to make a decision about this in any position that they, that they are, whoever, from any, any angle they yeah, I'm not sure I completely agree with that, 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 that whatever government, you know, it's one day eventually it's got to be dealt with. I always used to say that, that the situation was unsustainable. But after, you know, 55 years, it's looking pretty sustainable. I mean, it seems to just go on and on and on. You know, that is our that is a, one of our points of the discussions, Jonathan, and I think that things in Israel are inevitable and, you know, impossible until they become inevitable. I'm listening to someone else talking into our conversation. I did want to hear the... Greek ambassador and his question. If we still have time for that, I'm not sure. But if we do, uh, I think it's a really interesting question by the Greek ambassador to Israel, and it ties into our conversation. It's re it's uh, question number three. Let's try and listen. Good evening. I am Kyriakos Lukakis, ambassador of Greece in Israel. And this is my question to the unholies. Israel is heading to its fifth general election in three and a half years. During that period, many significant geopolitical changes have taken place on the regional and international level. Israel is still facing a number of security and foreign policy challenges. Could the upcoming elections mark a change in Israel's foreign policy? Or chances are that the new government, any new government, would choose the path of continuity in main areas such as Iran, the Palestinians, the peace process with the Palestinians, relations with the United States, and of course, Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. So very much on the lines that we were discussing just now, but he adds, uh, the uh, Ambassador Lukakis adds this interesting question about um, Iran, for example, and relations with the US. Um, you know, you've, we've, you've just, and we've both just talked before about the uh, continuity or not on the Palestinian question, but what about the ambassador's thoughts about whether things shift in terms of Israel's stance on Iran and elsewhere if there's a new government? Well, first of all, I, I think it will be a different, if Netanyahu is elected prime minister, there will be a very different relationship with a democratic president in the United States for now. That, that should be said, I think. Uh, on the issue of Iran, look, uh, we are in an election season. So what you're hearing from people like uh, Prime Minister Lapid Secretary of Defense Gantz, you're hearing things that will sound like Netanyahu as well, because they don't want to be caught less hawkish than he sounds. So when he says this is a terrible deal, 
this shouldn't happen, the return to the JCPOA, they agree with him. Inside the security echelon in Israel, there is a, uh, an argument going on whether at this point we have arrived at it's better to have a deal, any deal than no deal. Uh, so Israel is arguing on this. I, I think the, the general answer to the question would be there's not going to be a huge difference because the political situation is unstable and it will probably continue to be unstable even after November 1st. So I think anyone who aspires to have his hand on the helm of power will try not to shake the boat too much in any direction at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's a message of continuity, I think, on that point. I'm, I'm, I'm with those, as you know, um, we've talked about before, who think a deal is better than not, and I've thought it all the way along, um, and events, I think, have borne that out. I wanted just to see if we can find room for the question from a Bartosz Sejbuk uh, of the EU delegation. The, um, we're glad to have listeners among the uh, EU's representation in Israel. Uh, the, question, the question is, which outcome of the elections can realistically force Netanyahu to step down as Likud's chairman? No hint from the EU that that's an outcome they want, of course. Studiously neutral in this question, mm -hmm. but just in terms of the politics of this, uh, that's, it's an interesting one. He's, you know, we've been joking as if he is a permanent fixture and cannot be uh, moved. But what's the outcome that sees him actually not just live to fight another day? There, there are two things to remember. First of all, Netanyahu is on trial in three corruption cases. This is uh, taking its time, but in a year or two, <laughs> there will be a verdict in, these tri in this trial. Uh, so that is important. And Netanyahu believes uh, in his eye, he wants to be the prime minister when his trial, as his trial continues, because he thinks that might, in a way, I think, in his logic, or the logic of the people around him, that might affect the, the turnout. Um, so that is an important thing to remember, that the more time passes when Netanyahu is not the prime minister is bad for Netanyahu. So I think an outcome in which there is no clear outcome, and Yair Lapid continues to be prime minister as a caretaker government, this can last for a while, is not a good result for Netanyahu. And at the end of the day, that could arrive, his, even his supporters and his staunchest supporters can reach to a point when they say, listen, we need to, to, to continue this political system. Somehow, you need to move aside. The fact it hasn't happened for four elections doesn't mean it didn't, won't happen for the fifth one, but it is it does signal that it's is a tough uh, block to break apart. One question which we have to close out on just because we couldn't have asked for a, a more of a gift. How could new Israeli citizens who've just moved to Israel understand the system, the politics in general? What are the best ways to decide who's the best candidate for them? Which media sources do you recommend? Well, we do Ob recommend Jonathan Friedland. I well, don't know. What obviously, do you obviously, they need to be watching you on Channel 12 News. Uh, that but wasn't also, what I was aiming to. I would mm -hmm. make a general, gentle recommendation that you should be listening, uh, unnamed questioner, to the Unholy podcast every week where you can hear me and Yoni Levy in conversation. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be with you for the, uh, the Centre for Jewish Impact for this conversation. Uh, Yonit, I think um, we've, you, well, you've taught me a lot, certainly, today. <laughs> um, I thought it was, uh, I, I hope that we, I, I always am worried about talking about Israeli politics because it's so complicated. I have to admit, it's complicated for me, too. Like, I can look at it and I'm like, I don't understand. You have to see that when at 10 o'clock at night, when I get the exit polls on election night, and I look at the numbers and I look at the list of parties and I, and I say, what is going on? So it's, it's amazing. I will just let you like leave, Jonathan, with this thinking about the Israeli public going to the polls four times in three and a half years. And the election, the voter turnout is still around 70%. It's either a little bit lower or a little bit higher. The highest uh, rate, by the way, was in the third election, 71%. And as much as, you know, they're, they're driving the Israeli public crazy, but they're still going to the polls. They're still going to vote. It's still important to them. And I think that is an optimistic tone. I mean, we're, we're going to vote. We still care about it. We're not really decisive, but we do care. So I think that is that is very, very important. Uh, that is a positive thought. Whatever else you can say about <laughs> Israel, and uh, heaven knows plenty of people have lots to say, uh, including those people who've been with us today. It is a vibrant and uh, active boisterous democracy. Um, I think these questions we've had, we thank all the people, diplomats, listeners, uh, diplomats who are listeners, all of you, 
We thank you for your questions. Apologies to those whose questions we couldn't get to, um, but thank you so much for, um, for sending them and for listening to us this afternoon.